hybrid sort of conversation workshop, but kind of an informal conversation where Ronnie talks with us and we ask questions. Ronnie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you take it from here. These folks, though, you know, uh, for them to sit quiet for a while <laughs> is difficult. So let them interact with you with questions and answers. We'll be grateful that you're here. Hey, hey. Thank you.
or anything else that's in that canon. It's just that we've been so used to hearing that terminology that we don't realize that it exists. There's other people. Human beings are not as original as we think we are. Mm -hmm. uh, given, you know, it, chances are if one person thought of something in one continent, somebody was thinking about that same thing in another continent. Uh, something that really gave me a way to really understand that outside of music was uh, I read a book more recently called 1491. And this is a book that talks about Mesoamerica, actually. And it's a big book like this. But it talks about the history of Mesoamerica from 20,000 years ago till the present. And how, where I come from, I've always heard of the Fertile Crescent, where agriculture was born, writing was born, and everybody. And, and as much as I am proud of the culture I've come from, I'm always one that's kind of like poking at them and saying, I don't know, other people might have done the same thing too. <laughs> And, and the truth is, yes, because around that same time, if we look at the entire globe as this biosphere, just like anything else grows or evolves or it becomes extinct, we too are the same way as human beings. So why is it to say our brain development is not going to be, it's not going to be different from somebody who might be a, a pygmy or, a, a, or, or somebody living in, on an island in New Zealand, might be having the same thoughts as, as a native who may have worked uh, in South America or might have been in Latin America. So something that was really poignant out of this book in 1491 was that uh, they were cultivating maize, corn, at the same time that we were cultivating agriculture in the Fertile Crescent. So it's very important to understand what the scope, how these things work. So I took that and superimposed it on music as well. Music worked in the same way. So classical music, as we know it today, the Western classical music, was built upon a lot of the stuff I talked about in my play yesterday. A lot of that music, in fact, hundreds of years after Zidiab established his conservatory, after music and art flourished in what was basically the hub of European knowledge. I mean, Cordoba and Spain was the hub. It was where Germans came. It was where English came. It was where many of Europeans came to learn. Right? It was one of those hubs of learning and took it back. And many of the established conservatories thereafter actually modeled their pedagogy after what they learned in Andalusia. So to say that these histories are disconnected is a fallacy. That's a, a more of a political uh, statement than it is a cultural one. Because all you have to do is walk through Andalusia, you're going to see the architecture that harkens back to this period. It's inseparable. You're going to see the language and music like flamenco and all of these different styles. But even within these groups, they started to actually uh, also evolve. So I gave you right there, Samari, and Nahawen is the name of the actual scale. It's like saying, you know, Beethoven's fifth in C minor. It's the same thing. Samari, Tafil, and Nahawen, Do. So that's how I might say that. The composer of that particular piece was modern. His name is Mas'ud Jamil. Masoud Jamil was an early Ottoman composer, not early, he was more of a late Ottoman composer, turn of the century, 19th century, early 20th century. But prior to him, there were many other composers. I'd say that this style of music and classical music was really its heyday about the late 19th to 20th century, but really began in the Ottoman Empire, in Ottoman times, uh, because they started to write it down. Uh, it wasn't just oral. So today, you can go on a website that one person in Turkey created called Nezen, and there are literally over 10,000 pieces transcribed, ready for you to play. From folk stuff to Mevlavi uh, which are uh, spiritual hymns from the Rumi tradition, to the classical tradition, spanning centuries. Now what's fascinating about this is there's a piece, and I'll play you a little excerpt of it, and this is in the Makam tradition. It's just a musical theory style of writing.
in the Makam tradition by a Moldovan prince, Dmitri Kantemir. And he was a European prince who was exiled from his place of origin, but was also a composer. Ended up in the Ottoman courts and just composed tons of music in this music theory that was popular at that time. If you go back even a little bit further, and we're going to find a fulcrum, if you will, between that bridge of East and the West. And this is in the 13th century in a repertoire of music called the Cantigas de Santa Maria. If you haven't heard, heard these, they're really lovely pieces. Ultimately, what they were was folk music from Andalusia, composed by Alfonso, I believe, like the seventh or something like that, in Spain. And they were, the lyrics that were placed on it were an homage of Mother Mary. But the music that's there is just a folk tradition. You can even hear the modulation of what was happening in the 13th century Andalusia, which was music that was what I'm playing for you right now on instruments that I'm playing for you. This is something that you may have seen a, a picture or a bust from this, because it's taken from this codex of, of books. Uh, of There's a, a light-complected person holding a European lute and a dark-complected person holding an oud, and they're <laughs> sitting right next to each other. That's taken from the Cantigas de Santa Maria. And this repertoire of, of music is in honor of Mary, but the music that was taken it's, and it's become a trend even to this day, where people will take popular folk music and just put religious lyrics on top of it, even though it's a song that's already made. A lot of people do that. And I've discovered that this is done in Hindu, because I've recorded a lot of bhajan. And I remember one time somebody bringing me a list of songs, we wrote all of these songs. And I'm recording the music, and I'm like, it sounds familiar. Man, you're an amazing songwriter. <laughs> and they wrote the lyrics. And then I find the original Bollywood song that <laughs> took the music from. But this has been something since time immemorial. In fact, there's a large tradition of uh, Jewish liturgical music, piyutim. And uh, there was one famous rabbi, Chaim something, I forgot his last name. And he made a killing, like in his industry, of taking old like Egyptian songs and just putting Hebrew religious lyrics on top of it. Uh, and it, it was familiar to people. That's why they, they do it, right? Just much like what we have today is our patriotic songs were originally English or Irish drinking songs. <laughs> with different lyrics, right? Um, but I, I, I don't want to digress too much. I just wanted to make a point that one of those things I'm always doing, I taught a, uh, a world music course that I created at the Chicago Academy of the Arts. It's a private high school that focuses on the arts. And many of my students who were coming in, brilliant students, but either were from the world of jazz or the world of Western classical music. And to them, that was the pinnacle of all music. Now the problem with that is implicitly, what they're coming in with though is also a notion that any other music or the people that perform it are inferior to this. This notion is something that's very dangerous. And so I wanted to kind of like pop their little bubble a little bit and say, that's wonderful, you know, I, here's, a, here's an ood. I'll play you jazz on it. I remember playing one time, uh, it was an Iron Maiden song for one of my students. <laughs> Stone, and he etched into it with what you call a stylus. That was his stylus. 
there wasn't difference in the thinking, only the technology that advanced it. Sometimes we lose sight of thinking that the advancement of that technology by virtue or default advances our thinking. And that's where I try to stop them, to understand that wherever you're, you've arrived with your classical or jazz music, understand that somebody has thought of these things prior, and it's cumulative, it's iterative, it's built upon these things from before. So this is why it's very important for me to kind of present that we have a classical music tradition. But even in that classical music tradition, sometimes we also evolve. For example, this is now considered part of the classical music tradition. <laughs> Actually, a whole 
music for them, there's a whole style and a whole genre. These are nomadic people that have been all over, right? But when they get to Eastern Europe, the instrumentation and whatever is available in their reach, uh, they take those instruments like violin, ooh, guitar, dulcimer, hammer dulcimer, and they create a style of music. So this, these people brought with them this very upbeat kind of music that's in Eastern Europe. It's heard in Ottoman times, because they were there in Ottoman times as well. And it's taken, and it's like, hey, let's turn this into a classical form. This is what Bartok did. This is what every classical composer has ever done. Uh, whether, you know, people will admit it or not, but that's exactly what they've done. They go to either nature, the bar, <laughs> usually the bar, uh, or they'll go to the street where the vendors are, and listen for what's happening, and then they take it, and they fashion it, and they create it. You know, a story might seem crude when you hear it from somebody else, but when an author sits down and pens it, with all of the elaboration and all of the details around it, becomes a book. It's kind of like what a symphony is, it's kind of like what, what happens with this kind of music. So that's, that's basically what I'm just trying to get across, is that style of music, of classical music, it's not just Middle Eastern music, right? I hear people always say, I love Indian music. I'm like, oh, okay, do you like Bollywood, pop, folk, Rajasthani folk, the religious, or do you, do you like the, the classical Carnatic or classical? It's like saying, I love American music. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what kind? <laughs> yeah, it's not enough to just say that. You can't just describe. Because there's, yeah, there's American rock, but there's American pop. But then we have also Korean pop, we have Middle Eastern pop, we have European pop, we have all kinds of pop music. So it's just important to say that when something as universal as music, and, and I, I hesitate to say music is a universal language, it, it's not because it means something different to everybody else. I will say that sound is a universal understanding. Mm -hmm. Because sound is all around us. Sound is what governor, governs the entire universe, in fact. You know, vibration, if we break it down to that. You know, God spoke, that's vibration that sets the entire universe into motion. And so, anyway, I diverged there <laughs> a little bit. I was digressing for you. But, but it's all connected. Because it's all connected, you know. Music is, is one of those things that people will understand immediately before you can even understand the language, right? The sound of something, the sound of uh, even the native people who were on these lands. You know, they understood and interpreted music in a very unique way. Uh, with the wind blowing through a valley, blowing through the reeds, creating the whistling through the reeds. Uh, and that was how they learned and taught music, in fact, is you go to nature and you sit down, you listen to everything until it becomes very acutely aware uh, to you of what's happening around you by a sound. Uh, and even to this day, I was reading an amazing article um, that was talking about using sound therapy to help with heart disease, uh, in that using vibration, they can create different patterns and force a cell to create a different shape, so that it, it doesn't remain in its particular shape. I, I got to dig deeper into it, but they show patterns of different cells that were used, uh, that vibration and sound were used change its shape. And in essence, changing its shape also changed uh, the way that it functioned. So it's fascinating. <laughs> Sound and vibration are really where a lot of things are at. This is, I tell my students, you, you know, and, and friends, and people say, oh, you're so good at this, or, you know, it's just, mastering an instrument, this is just an instrument of sound. This is sound, I can make sound on this, I can make sound on this, I can make sound on trash cans, or on the pots and pans that when I was a kid, and my mom would say, put them away. And you see today on the highways, kids make these sounds on buckets. It's expression in the end, right? They're just trying to express themselves. So you can become virtuosic on this, just like somebody can become virtuosic on a, a drill or a hammer or a screwdriver. These are tools. These are, that's all they are. This is just a tool of sound. Uh, it's appealing to the human ear, because somebody took the time to craft something of that nature. But, um, again, that is very important, though, to make a, a, a distinction that I'm talking about here, is because people in the East, in general, they didn't always view music the way we understand it today, you know, and, and even a few decades ago. Today, you know, music, for many, is unfortunately a commodity, something for consumption, 
a little bit before that, there's something that people practiced. Every house had a piano or an accordion or a guitar or something, and then people saw it as an integral part of uh, development of the human. Back in the times of even Zidiev and prior to him, people viewed music as a science. It was a science that was inseparable from astronomy, from mathematics, from uh, anything of, of the sciences for that matter. So they would use the notions of rhythm, they would use the notions of what a scale is, the intervals between different notes, to explain these sorts of things. So it's, it's really important to understand that's the role of music, but more importantly, that's the role that music and art played in this region. And then slowly it started to spread out to the rest of the world. Anyway, uh, we have a little time, but I'm, I'm curious. We can make this interactive. I don't want to say this isn't the lecture. <laughs> well, I have a question yes, for please. you then. Would you just, I'm so happy to be this close to you and at Oud because I didn't really see it up close. And, did, and it's amazing. And so would you just tell us about that instrument, how old it is? And ooh, just tell us. Yes, absolutely. Amazing. So um, I'll start by, you know, I'll start backwards. I'll start by telling you where I got <laughs> This particular oud is actually uh, made from an old, old place called Beacon, New York. <laughs> and uh, it's actually made by my friend John Gregara, who's a master luthier uh, and uh, a master um, maker of not just oud, but uh, kanun, which is like a flat harp, uh, guitars, violins, everything. I can make anything. Uh, and he's very meticulous in what he does. Um, that's where this particular one came from. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I, I own one from Syria, I own one from Turkey. I mean, this is an instrument that, now going all the way back, uh, it's kind of reminiscing from the play last night, this is an instrument that originates in Mesopotamia. And we see busts of it, and you know, we see uh, busts, but um, images, pictures of this instrument as far back as 2,000 years ago. And originally it starts off with maybe one or two strings, uh, and there's an animal skin across. Now, it's been since time immemorial, the moment somebody figured out, uh, oh, here's a long stick, here's a body, I'm going to put a, a drum. They stick a stick on a drum, and then they stretch the entrail of an animal across it, and all of a sudden you have a stringed instrument. Um, I just read this really fascinating book recently called Music, a Subversive History, and talks about the intertwining of music with uh, violence and sex. <laughs> uh, but he didn't mean it just specifically those limited terms. He meant everything from, well, the drum wouldn't have become a drum had not somebody had to slaughter an animal, all of its blood and guts and everything, take the skin off, clean the skin off, and then eventually put it over a frame. Because that's the only way you're going to get the skin for that drum. Right? It doesn't just appear synthetically out of nowhere. So those things were intertwined. And the, de the evolution of an instrument like this is not unlike that. Initially, you had a skin on this. But then somebody figured, oh, let's put wood. Wood resonates a little bit better. And then that's where it kind of gets its name. El Oud, in Arabic, actually literally means twig or branch or a piece of wood. And so this whole thing is a piece of wood. And there are several stories and legends and myths. One person says, oh, that's named after Lamak, one of Adam's grandsons, who they hung his tree, uh, remains in a tree, and it took the shape of the wood. <laughs> Some might have believed that story. That's cool. <laughs> I have no problem with it. But what you see today in this form relatively took place about the 7th, 8th century. Right? And then it evolved from there. Initially with two strings, three strings, four, and Zidiev is credited with adding a fifth course of strings to this instrument, that middle course right here. And then later, uh, people added a sixth string, which acts kind of at what we call a drum. So at the heart of Middle Eastern music is improvisation, and uh, they call it taksi. It's from the root word, Arabic uh, root word, hasan, which means to just partition something. And what you're partitioning, ultimately, is groupings of three to four notes at a time. Like forming a, a word or a sentence or something, right? And in, in doing so, that's uh, the heart of the improvisation. Your virtuosity is how well can you formulate 
sentences in browser two and, and, and extemporaneously, basically, using these things. Uh, so adding these additional strings helped one become a little bit more, uh, it gave you more opportunities, more um, choices that you can actually go through in the positions and the way it was tuned. Today, it's tuned mainly like guitar. It's E, A, D, G. And then another fourth, which is C here, and then you have the drone. That drone is meant to kind of just kind of keep going. Come up around box time, but it was really almost for a 
functionary kind of purpose. Prior to that, even classical music, Baroque music, the tuning was in different places. Mm -hmm. So there were these microtones coming out. But because it's fretless, you can also play um, these microtones on here as well. Mm -hmm. That's so how long have you had this instrument? This particular one I got in 2019, when I was on the road. I have one before that that, yeah, it, it got, it's not beat up, it's just, it's <laughs> I play it a lot in a lot of strange settings. My gosh, and why the detail? And yeah. why does the neck have a bend in it? And how is that different than a guitar? What does that, how well, does it change it? That's a great question. I get asked that all the time. And I asked the luthier, I said, why is the neck like that? <laughs> and um, even guitars. And even to this day, you see violins that are still like that. And usually what happens is the pegs are push-in pegs. These are actually mechanical. They don't look like it. But they finally developed mechanical pegs. But prior to that, you would push in the peg and then return it so it would stick in one place. What one luthier told me is by having a bent here, you create more tension over across this instead of just having it flat like that and unwind it. Makes sense. So that was my his explanation to me. <laughs> And what is the piece that I watched you put on and off the, uh, in your holding it in your right hand? Oh, this one. This is the plectrum, the pick, basically. And in Arabic, we call this a risha, which just, it means feather, because that's what they used to use to pluck these instruments, is the feather of uh, a bird. Usually, uh, it, could be, it could have been any, a crow to uh, an eagle to uh, a pheasant to uh, a peacock. And depending on what that person wanted to do with it. Um, also the shading from a bullhorn. Mm -hmm. So a very thin shading of a bullhorn, mm -hmm. uh, plucked against the string. Today, I mean, they make plastic. I still own some that are shavings from a bullhorn as well. well that are made from a shaving of a bullhorn as well. Uh, but these are plastics. That's what I use right now. Um, I was not, it just seems like it's more sensible because it fits in your hand instead of a little guitar pick that's easy to drop. Some, some people, you know, um, it really varies. Some people find it, that even on the road, I know people who play a with a, a pick, a guitar, like a guitar pick. Hmm. It's not common. Part of the difference though, you know, I came to this instrument from the guitar. I, I picked up the guitar and started learning rock and roll right away. And I was using a guitar pick. And when I went to this instrument, I started playing it like it was the guitar. But it wasn't giving me the sound I was looking for. I mean, it started, you know, I, I knew where to put my fingers. And that's kind of how it would come out, right? But then I was hearing other players, and I thought, man, what are you doing that's different? And I realized, it's not picking, it's plucking. So this is a plucked instrument, more than it is really a picked instrument. Doing that actually resonates inside the bowl versus just doing. You hear that? It's not about hitting it harder. It's about plucking it so that you get the vibration inside the bowl, which is why it's shaped in such a way. It's so that you create this kind of. How do you lower... pluck it with that? I mean, I would plucking is like this, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, it is it is plucking it. It's in the same way that a uh, harpsichord is plucked as well. You know, it's, it's a plucked instrument for many purposes. Uh, instruments are really just beta types of other future engineering. You know, people who sit down and, and create these instruments, yes, it is about music. And it, but what it does is it also instigates how do things work together? How does a pulley system work together? How does a pluck thing work together? How does you know, every one of these, I'm a recording engineer and I have a recording studio. I remember taking a course in, um, not taking a course, I wanted to test out a proficiency exam out of my quantitative reasoning. I'm like, you know, I was a real estate appraiser, I know how to do statistics, I know how to do all these things, I don't want to take a course on this, I'll just test out of it. So. I needed to present three forms of evidence, and one of those forms of evidence I did statistics, another form of evidence was, you know, just a, a economics and finance that I did through banking, and I thought, well, what can I use for this third form that has to be something completely different? And I immediately, I was in the middle of mixing a song, and I'm looking at the equalizer, 
I thought, this is an x-y coordinate graph. This is a graph that has x and y. And what the x and y was were frequencies of vibration and their level. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, this is music. That's exactly what music is. I, when I do this, you hear a tone. Some people might hear a note and say, oh, that's A. A device hears 440 hertz. That's the unit of measurement. Now what's fascinating about that is you can extrapolate that concept, that's why music and science are inseparable. You extrapolate that concept and then guess what? Every single sphere in the entire cosmos has a, a, a vibration, a frequency. Like, so literally, like the Earth is in C sharp. Other planets might be in B or D. Spheres, anything that revolves. I remember when the internet came out. <laughs> it was 19, I was, I just started college, I think, it was like 1995 or something like that. And I just, I was fascinated by this new technology called the internet. And Yahoo was like one of the only search engines, Google was not even in existence yet. And uh, I, I remember hitting on the tech tab to see something. And the first headline I said, scientists discover black hole revolves in B flat. <laughs> what? what are you talking about? And it was a, the headline alone was mind blowing. And that's when I really made a, a connection that I, I mentioned before. Even in, in times of Islam, the word and term music didn't come into play until maybe later 10th, 11th century. And the word itself is from the muses of Greek origin. That's where music comes from. Music. Prior to that, and still to this day though, in Arabic, the way people may have referred to it was called Pendisit Assault. Pendisit Assault literally means the engineering of sound, the construct of sound. Mm -hmm. And it's still viewed in such a way, and for people to view it in such a way is very important, because they're inseparable from the physical world around us. Every single thing, that, that, this, this, you, me, everything on this planet is vibration. That vibration is the deeper definition of what we call music, if you will. Uh, so, yeah, this is 440 hertz, and the planet we live on, it happens to be in C-sharp, <laughs> and changes. So if anybody ever, ever lets you know. If you've ever gone to San Francisco, there's a tuning fork. I, uh, I forgot what street it was on. It was up by Berkeley, take it back, it was right by Berkeley University. I was doing a stint at Berkeley Repertory Theater. And at the time I would cross Addison uh, Street, right in the middle, there was a tuning fork that somebody put there, it's like an art installation, but it was a tuning fork of the earth. Hmm. And, and it read on the bottom, you know, how we arrived at those hertz. So I was able to basically, the short story is, I was able to test out my quantitative reasoning by showing them that music is also science and yeah. mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? This, I, I don't mean for this to be a controversial question, but I mean to, to help me understand. Because you, you're a musician, you are also Muslim, and, and I cannot understand why in Afghanistan, in the current um, political environment, that music is banned. You know, it is a good question. I get asked this all the time. I, I remember when I was a kid, getting people coming up to me, you know, music is haram, music is a sin, music is this and that. Yeah. And I think that rather than being so absolute in a stance on something, that it, it's just, you know what, that, that theory or that concept is not exclusive to Islam, though, either. Yeah. Uh, Christianity, for a very long time, for over a thousand years, chose the only kind of music you were allowed to listen to. There are particular scales in Christian, early Christian music that people were not even allowed to use because they thought it summoned the devil. Uh, even in, in some Orthodox Jewish traditions, and I've done a lot of Jewish music, it's just the Abrahamic faiths, right? Where the counterpart of this in Hindu religion, singing, playing, and dancing are a part of all the belief system. That's what you find in the temple. So Afghanistan is one concept, but I found that same notion in other places as well, even here in America, where I've told, you know, been told by people, music is a sin, music is a sin. 
I said, explain it to me. You know, my grandfather built one of the first mosques in, in Chicago. Uh, he never thought music was a sin. Uh, it, it's how you view it. Now, just like anything, wine can be used in church to represent the blood of Christ. Wine can also be <laughs> drunk by somebody who gets in a car and goes and kills someone. Is it the wine's fault? Or is it the interpretation of how that person used that wine? Now, I just gave you a very alternate understanding of music, of how I viewed it, and I know that people in ancient times viewed it in the same way. Now, the irony is this, it's all about understanding. You know, sometimes it could very well be that somebody who became anti-music <laughs> wants to scapegoat, because nobody's ever scapegoated their religious text, right? <laughs> to say that, it says it here, it's interpretation. In the Sufi tradition, music and singing and vocalizing is an integral part of this. But I'll give you this right now. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Anybody wants to tell me otherwise. It's part and parcel of what Islam was. That music theory spread along with the Arabic language from Indonesia all the way to Morocco and to Spain with Islam. Why? Because people who recite the Quran even are using these scales. Mm -hmm. Every call to prayer. If you go to Turkey and you listen to the call to prayer, the morning prayer is in the Maqam Sabah. <laughs> who still adhere to that kind of uh, um, practice. I have many friends who are uh, munshid, and a munshid is basically a, a Muslim cantor, if you will, you know, somebody who sings religious songs. They can't be what they are without going through a maqam class, which is teaching what, yes, you can call music, then it becomes semantics at that point. Some people feel like the be more direct to your question, some people feel that, at least what I've been told in my experience, that, uh, oh, it's going to steer you away from the religion, it's going to steer you away from this, it's going to take you to the, the bordels and, the, and it's going to take you to, down a path of, you know, not so righteous. Yeah. And yes, that can happen, but that can also happen with religion too. Mm. Yes. You know, that can also happen with anything else mm -hmm. on the planet. People become so self-righteous or misuse what they're given that they forget that there's a balance to this world that is a part of this world. So, to say music is haram, as a sin, I have yet to somebody show me exactly in the Qur'an where that is. It's interpretation, ultimately. Now, why is that so important to understand? Here's the real reason behind it. Because since time immemorial, artists, especially musicians, especially people who know how to gain popularity among people, will usually be the people who will change power. Mm. Will usually be the people who will upset the status quo. Mm -hmm. That is exactly why things like that happen. Mm -hmm. Because it's a matter of power. Because the truth is, music or art practice in general flourished under Islam. Flourished. From everywhere. Andalusia was a perfect prime example of that. 
Uh, and again, anytime you hear the call of prayer, it's sent to a maqam. I can tell you what maqam it is. And the person who's usually doing it should know, at least, if, if you want to be to the full extent of understanding this, uh, I don't want to use big words here, but you know, to use the, the epistemological aspect of the, the, the religion to also the ecclesiastic aspect of the religion, you need to be very well aware of every single maqam, because those maqams are exactly what the reciter of the Qur'an is also using. The master cantor, Abdel Basit, knew every single one of the maqams that he used when he recited the Qur'an. And in fact, many musicians in the early 20th century who would go to Al-Azhar Mosque in Egypt had to learn maqams. And many of them became composers and musicians as well. So, it's, it's part and parcel, it's essential. Now, just like in Christianity, just like in any other uh, religion, there are many different denominations, different sects, different practices, and, and that's not just Sunnis and Shias, for example, you know, or Protestants and Catholics. We're talking even within a Polish Catholic is not the same as a Mexican Catholic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not the same as an Italian Catholic. Mm -hmm. So a Pakistani Muslim is not the same as the Egyptian Muslim. Not to say that they're not Muslims or they're not Christians, but culture plays a large role in how one believes. You can't separate that. You just, you just can't. That doesn't mean that we're not all brothers and sisters. For me, it doesn't matter what your religion is. If you're a human being, you know, and you have red blood, that's, that's the part. So, I mean, going back to that question, smashing instruments and doing all of those things, think about it for a moment. Do you think an artist is going to take out a gun or a sword and hurt somebody or kill somebody? Mm -hmm. It's because they're easy targets. That's why people go that. They're going to find less resistance. If you really want to combat what's happening in your society, don't go after the musician necessarily. Why don't you go target the problem? You know, target the real problem. How about foreign intervention or the corruption that lies amongst politicians? Target those things. But musicians make an easy target. Artists make an easy target. Partly also because there is not a force in this universe that's as powerful as what we modernly define as music. Because it's literally what set the universe into motion. Vibration. Yeah. All of those things. Mm -hmm. So, it's all about interpretation. And in the end for me, I mean, my mother's from Jerusalem, my grandfather was a pious man, they had no problems with music. I've worked with Sufis, I've worked with recording uh, music uh, for Islamic purposes, for religious purposes, for Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Jews, a variety of different kinds of people. It's, it's just a form of expression. So in this sense, it's, it's an interpretation. Because if you go to Egypt, and you encounter the Shadlis, the Shadli Sufis, music is an integral part. Not every kind of music, but a certain kind of music, you know. So why over there, I don't know, why did they blow up Buddha statues? Mm -hmm. Why Why do, it, it's, it's called ignorance. Because mm -hmm. that's the truest people, I think. That's, that's really what it is. Thank you. So stay